A good vach, Shavua Tov. A great week to you, my holy sisters and brothers. Great to be learning with you. Motzi Shabbos on a Saturday night. Let's light up the darkness. Who's in the house? And I can't tell you how much it warms my heart. We come out of Shabbos. It's Saturday night on the East Coast. It's late Saturday night. And here you are. Fantastic. <coughs> Paula in the great northwest. Shandora in the Bronx. Paula with the flags. Sh uh, Sharon in New Jersey. Bella in Florida. Ryan in Jacksonville. Melissa in Great Neck Guy in Ohio. Joe in the Inland Empire. Bill in Mid Missouri. Joe saying, do you have rain yet? It's not raining here, but <laughs> the, the app says it's, it, it's coming any second now. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very blessed. Thank God we have a fireplace. So I was like loading in the wood <laughs> through the window because uh, once it's pouring, it's going to be impossible to get the wood in. And tonight's going to be after the class, you know, just a cozy, you know, Sal and Nina have a fire type of night. Uh, who else? Alice says, Shalom, Aoife in Florida, Marjorie in Georgia, Spencer in West Hartford. Aoife says, I'm getting no sound. Everybody getting sound okay? Any issues? Let me know if there's any issues. Hopefully it's okay. Uh, Karen says, Shavua Tov. Welcome, everybody. My app says microphone working. So hopefully everything is okay. All right. Our daf is page 92. We're going to pick it up at the bottom of page 91b. We're in tractate Bava Kama, the 21st volume of the Talmud. And we're discussing Mishnah number four here in chapter eight. And Mishnah, <laughs> you go from Friday at noon till Saturday night, it's like ancient history. Right, but our Mishnah uh, is all about that if you if you humiliate someone, so the sages set some set amounts for that. In other words, where you have hit a person or slapped them, which is worse, or slapped them with the back of the hand, or taken their cloak, or unclothed them, or uncovered their hair, a public type of humiliation, even though it doesn't leave a bruise, it, it may not even you know cause so much physical pain. It's a public humiliation, and that can lead to some heavy damages indeed. Okay, that's the general topic. We picked this up near the bottom, 91B. In connection with the prohibition against cutting down trees. Now, this came up because if somebody cuts down your trees, uh, they violate do not destroy. They had obviously no right uh, to damage your property. They're going to owe you for that. Uh, and we're also talking about this idea that well, you know, if I tell Tom to cut down Bill's trees, you know, obviously Bill has been damaged. Uh, Tom did the cutting. Am I going to be liable to pay damages? No, because Tom, you know, shouldn't have listened to me. Uh, there's no agency for transgression, and he's the one that went ahead. Now, if he didn't know that he was cutting Bill's trees and he thought he was following my instructions, you know, to trim my tree, my own trees... That would be a different conversation. Uh, and generally speaking, we have a prohibition on destroying needlessly, right? We don't want to throw away food needlessly. We don't want to throw away clothing or destroy it needlessly. I mean, sometimes things just get old and you need space in your house. It's okay, obviously. You shouldn't become a hoarder. Uh, but there is a prohibition on destroying things needlessly. Okay. In connection with the prohibition against cutting down trees, uh, and also, by the way, there's a specific prohibition on cutting down trees. You know, when you besiege a city, do not cut down its fruit trees, I believe is how the verse goes. That's more specific. Okay, but in connection with the general prohibition against cutting down trees, the Gemara notes, Rob said, with regard to a palm tree that still produces fruit in the amount of a kav, uh, that it is prohibited to cut it down due to the prohibition of when you shall besiege a city, you shall not destroy the trees. Now, when you hear that, listen closely, right? If a date palm, right, is still producing a cove of dates, right, a, a certain volume of dates, it's prohibited to cut it down, which tells you, well, if it's not producing that volume of dates, 
it is permitted to cut it down, right? So you might have a, re first of all, obviously you can cut down trees for lumber, uh, but a productive fruit tree, you cannot cut down. You know, fruit trees eventually age. It's something to think about, right? Trees have lifespans. Uh, trees don't live forever. So eventually a tree gets old. It's not productive anymore. You know, it can be a bit of a rotten tree. That can become dangerous. Branches can fall, etc. Uh, and you want to make room for a more productive tree. So, of course, then you can cut it down. But when is a tree deemed not no longer productive so that it's permitted to cut it down? So in the case of a date palm, when it no longer produces a cob of dates. Now, the Gemara raises an objection to the statement of Rav from what was taught in a Mishnah, Tractate Shaviyat 410. How much fruit must be on an olive tree? so that one may not cut it down, a quarter kav. So why did Rav say that it must produce a full kav? And the Gemara answers, olive trees are different since they are significant. Therefore, even a quarter kav is valuable. Rabbi Hanina said, my son, Shivchat, did not die for any reason other than that he cut down a fig tree before its time. And Ravina says, but if the lumber was greater in monetary value than its fruits, it is permitted to chop it down, and this does not violate the prohibition against destroying a fruit tree. Now, there were two thoughts in that little paragraph, uh, right? So, but the latter one, that the lumber was greater in monetary value, okay, that general law that, you know, if the, if the lumber of the tree is going to be more valuable than the small amount of fruit that it produces, it's permitted. About this thing that Rabbi Hanina said that his son died, uh, for not any other reason than that he cut down a fig tree before its time. A really saying that he committed, you know, it does not seem like a very big transgression and that his life was taken from him because of that. Uh, you know, obviously there's no quid pro quo uh, that when people sin in this world, you know, they're taken from this world. Sadly, we know that they're terrible murderers, rapists, kidnappers, you know, truly vile criminals that seem to live on and on and keep committing their crimes until they're caught. Uh, and why would somebody be taken from this world, you know, because of a relatively minor transgression? <clears throat> I think what he was saying was simply, you know, that that was the only sin that he had in his life. It must have been an incredibly righteous person. Uh, and he's not saying that because of that sin is why he was taken from this world, but it was the only sin that he had on his record. Uh, you know, the bigger question, why do the righteous suffer? Why do the wicked prosper? You know, we've talked about it other times. We'll talk about it again, but beyond the scope of tonight's class. Okay, this halacha, this law uh, about cutting down productive trees is also taught in a baraisa. The verse states, only the trees of which you know that they are not trees for food, them you may destroy and cut down. Only the trees of which you know, this is referring to a tree that bears fruit used for food, and it is permitted to cut down this type of tree only under certain circumstances. That they are not trees for food, this is referring to a barren tree. And the Gemara asks, and since the Baraisa will ultimately include all types of trees, so that even a tree that produces fruit may be cut down, what then is the meaning of when the verse states that are not tree that they are not trees for food, which indicates that it is permitted to cut down only a barren tree? And the Gemara answers, it is to give precedence to cutting down a barren tree over a tree whose fruit is used for food. Right? If you need lumber and there are two trees there and one produces only a small amount of fruit, enough that you could cut it down, but the other one produces no fruit, okay, so ch chop down the barren tree first. Now, one might have thought, and now we're on page 92a, one might have thought that he must give precedence to the cutting down of a barren tree, even if the barren tree is greater in monetary value than the fruit-bearing tree. And the verse states only, which teaches that there is an exception to the rule. Similarly, if the fruit-bearing tree itself would be worth more as lumber than for its fruits, it would be permitted for one to cut it down. And the Gemara relates the sharecropper of Shmuel, brought him dates, and Shmuel ate them and tasted the taste of wine in his dates. And he said to his sharecropper, what is this? And the sharecropper said to him, the date palms stand among the grapevines and therefore contain a taste of wine from the grapes. And Shmuel said, do they weaken the wine 
i.e. the grapevines, so much that it is possible to taste the wine in the dates? Tomorrow, cut down the date palms and bring me from their marrow to eat. So the marrow of a date palm, what is that? That's the heart of the palm, right? Hearts of palms, it's actually something you can eat. Uh, but what it means, the heart of the palm is from that active growing area at the top of a palm tree. When you remove the heart of the palm, or what they're calling the marrow here, that kills the tree. Like if you chop off the top of a palm tree, it won't grow again. It's not like other kinds of trees. At that point, you might as well remove the whole thing down to the stump. Uh, interesting that date palms among grapevines uh, doesn't seem to violate kilayim, right? The, 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 the prohibition on growing diverse kinds. Uh, or he would have, you know, he would have prohibited for that reason. But he's saying no. The, it, I guess a grape, you know, a vineyard can can abut trees, uh, and that is different, you know, than growing wheat uh, in your vineyard, which would certainly be prohibited. Uh, but you know, now that the, the the growing of the date of the dates is interfering with the wine. Why would you cut down the date palms? Because wine is much more valuable. Grapevines are much more valuable than date palms, you know, which are to be found everywhere. So he said, bring me the marrow of the tree, meaning the date palm is gone. Now, the Gemara relates a similar incident. Rav Chista saw date palms growing among grapevines on his estate. And he said to his sharecropper, uproot the date palms, since one can purchase date palms with grapevines, as grapevines are more valuable, but... Uh, one cannot purchase grapevines with date palms. And that concludes our discussion of Mishnah number four. Here's Mishnah number five here in chapter eight. Despite the fact that the assailant who caused damage gives to the victim all of the required payments for the injury, his transgression is not forgiven for him in the heavenly court until he requests forgiveness from the victim as it is stated that God told Abimelech after he had taken Sarah from her husband Abraham, <clears throat> quote, Now therefore restore the wife of the man, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for you, and you shall live. Where does it say that Abimelech apologized to Abraham? Well, is Abraham going to pray for a man that hasn't, you know, made it right, as it were? He wouldn't pray for him if all he did was give Sarah back uh, after sort of taking her and taking her into the castle. Uh, but he, so it shows that he must have apologized, and that's why Abraham went ahead and prayed for Abimelech. And from where is it derived that if the victim does not forgive him, that he is cruel? As it is stated, and Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bore children. So from the example of Abraham, we see if you injure another person, you have to make it right. You have to pay damages. If you cause humiliation, pain and suffering, loss of livelihood, medical costs, you owe all those payments. And in addition, if you want to make it right before the heavenly court, you also have to apologize. And from the point of view of the victim, if somebody has made it right in terms of the monetary damages, etc., and apologized, uh, then you should forgive him. The exception to that rule is if someone slanders you. If somebody slanders you, you don't have to forgive. Uh, that's not according to all views, but according to some views. Now, the Mishnah continues with regard to one who says to another, and why would it be? Why would it be that if someone slanders you and then apologizes, you don't have to forgive? Because he can't make it right, right? When somebody slanders you, you know, the damage to the reputation spreads out in the world and you can never make that right. Now, the Mishnah continues with regard to one who says to another, blind my eye or cut off my hand or break my leg. And that person does so, well, the one who performed these actions is liable to pay for the damage despite having been instructed to do so uh, by the one who said, cut off my hand. Even if he explicitly instructed him, cut off my hand on the condition that you will be exempt from paying me damages, the one who cuts is nevertheless liable to pay damages. But... With regard to one who says to another, tear my garment or break my jug, and he does so, he is liable to pay for the damage. But if the owner of the garment or the jug said explicitly, 
break it or tear it on the condition that you will be exempt from owing me any uh, monetary damages, then the one who breaks or tears is exempt from payment. Uh, if one says to another, do so, i.e. cause damage to so-and-so on the condition that you will be exempt from payment, and he did so, he is liable, whether the instructions were with regard to the victim himself or whether the instructions were with regard to his property, right? If I tell you, you know, go harm Bill, don't worry, nothing will happen to you. So you go ahead and do it, relying on what? That I told you to do it and that I told you you wouldn't have to pay any damages? Well, you shouldn't have listened to me and there is no agency for transgression. And if you harm Bill or his property, you're going to be liable. The Gemara, the sages taught all these sums that in the previous Mishnah they said one is liable to pay for humiliating another or the compensation for his humiliation, for which there is a set amount. But for the victim's pain caused by the assailant, even if the assailant brings as offerings all the rams of Nebaioth, see Isaiah 60 verse 7, that are in the world, which are the best quality rams, his transgression is not forgiven for him in the heavenly court until he requests forgiveness from the victim. As it is stated, restore the wife of the man for he is a prophet and he shall pray for you. In the incident, right, this is when Abraham passed off his wife as his sister so that Abimelech's men, kind of very similar to the story in Egypt, but this is not in Egypt. Uh, this is Abimelech in, in, in Canaan. Uh, and but you know he was a powerful king, and uh, they were very concerned uh, that if they you know if she was understood to be Abraham's wife, that Abimelech would just have Abraham killed and take Sarah, who was very beautiful, uh, as one of his own wives. So they said, no, no, he's the she's the sister, and Abimelech took her into right, kidnapped her, took her, uh, but didn't bother to murder Abraham because it was only her brother. Then what happened was that Abimelech's household was cursed while Sarah was present in his household. Uh, meaning, and, and we'll talk about what it meant, that, what, what that curse was, uh, but all of the orifices were stopped up. What does that mean? I mean, for sure it meant that people couldn't have babies. It might have even meant that they couldn't go to the bathroom uh, during that time. And they realized that something big was going on. And then Abimelech was visited in a dream by God. Uh, who said, give that man his wife back. He is a prophet, uh, you know, and then he will pray for you, etc. So having quoted the verse, the Gemara asks, shall one infer from here that the wife of a prophet needs to be returned, but the wife of another individual need not be returned? Why did God say, give that, restore that, that man's wife to him? He is a prophet uh, regarding Abraham. And the Gemara answers that Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says, that Rabbi Yonason says, this is how the verse should be understood. Restore the wife of the man in any case, since she is his wife. And with regard to that which you, Abimelech, said, will you slay even a righteous nation? Did he not say himself to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother? Which was true, because uh, Abraham and Sarah were, I think, half-sister, half-brother. Uh, so uh, the answer is that you, Abimelech, are not so righteous since the reason Abraham said that Sarah was his sister is that he is a prophet and he already learned how to conduct himself based on your behavior as with regard, and, and some say they, you know, was not lying when he said that she's my sister because she was his half-sister. And others say he was not lying in the sense that people, refer, like I say to you, my holy sisters and brothers, and, you know, he could speak that way. And since Abraham was an utterly truthful person, was it really a lie? Uh, but, of course, you know, it was a subterfuge to cover up that she's his wife because then they would have murdered Abraham. Uh, and about this, right, the Gemara is saying... Uh, did he not say himself to me, she is my sister? And she even she herself said, he is my brother? And the answer is that you, Abimelech, are not so righteous. Since the reason that Abraham said that Sarah was his sister is that he is a prophet. And he had already learned how to conduct himself based on your behavior. As with regard to a guest who comes to town, does one ask him about matters concerning eating and drinking? Uh, what are your food preferences? What do you like? Are you allergic to anything? That would be the normal thing to ask somebody who comes in is going to be a guest uh, in your domain. 
What's not normal is what Abimelech did. Or does one ask him about matters concerning his wife? Does one ask a guest, oh, is she your wife? Is she your sister? Abimelech was to be blamed since Abraham thought that he intended to steal his wife. In other words, Abimelech's behavior prior to Abraham saying, she's my sister, uh, made it clear to Abraham, either because he's quite intelligent and perceptive, or because, in fact, it was his gift of prophecy, he could see that if he didn't say this, uh, that they were going to kill Abraham and take Sarah. So the Gemara remarks, from here it can be derived that a Gentile is executed for having transgressed a prohibition without awareness that the act was prohibited, like kidnapping, I, you know, you'd think you should know that, uh, since he should have learned and he did not learn. Right. So, you know, kidnapping a person does violate one of the seven, uh, the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noah, right? The seven Noahide commandments. Uh, and you can't say that, well, you know, I'm not Jewish. I never read the Torah. How was I supposed to know that kidnapping is prohibited? Answer, yeah, you should have known. That's it. Uh, and in the note, Rob Steinsalz says, uh, you know, it's a general principle in all countries that ignorance of the law is no excuse. And we're not talking about you didn't know that Jews are not allowed to, you know, start a fire on Shabbos. There's no reason why you would know that. But you should have known that nobody is permitted to kidnap another man's wife. Having mentioned the verses concerning the incident of Abraham and Abimelech, the Gemara explains other related verses in that story. For the Lord had obstructed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Now, where it says obstructed, this would be one of those cases where the translation would be better, something like, for the Lord had indeed obstructed, because, you know, when there's certain uh, words that are emphasized in the Torah, uh, what, what the Torah does is repeat the word, slightly changing the syntax, right? So here it says, atzor atzar, right? For the Lord had obstructed, but it's two verbs, atzor atzar, all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. And Rabbi Lazar says, why are these two obstructions, atzor atzar, both stated? One is stated with regard to a man that semen will not be discharged and two are stated with regard to a woman that semen will not be discharged from her and that she will not give birth. So as taught in Abaraisa, two are stated with regard to a man, semen and urine, uh, that men were unable to both urinate and discharge semen and three are stated with regard to a woman, semen and urine and birth. And Ravina says three are stated with regard to a woman, semen and urine, and, you know, number two, uh, meaning that they were unable to discharge stool as well. So consequently, well, consequently, they would be unable to relieve themselves at all. And four are stated with regard to a woman, semen and birth, and urine and anal sphincter. Uh, now, it's a little unclear what they mean when they're saying... Uh, that women are, you know, obstructed from emitting semen. So either that means, you know, that after lovemaking, you know, something might come out. Uh, or uh, it means, you know, that, 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 that having gone in, it can turn into a baby and then the baby won't come out, right? Uh, well, no, it says birth also. So, you know, whatever, the liquids, liquids, let's just say. So the verse states, For the Lord had obstructed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. The sages of the school of Rabbi Yanai say, Even a hen of the house of Abimelech did not lay her egg during that time. At any rate, Abimelech's household was clearly you know, cursed. They, they, they were obstructed. They were in pain. It was very bad. And all of them were experiencing it. And they realized something was going on. And then Abimelech had the dream where God told him, yeah, because you took that man's wife. So give her back. New subject. Now, the Gemara cites a series of questions that Rava asked Rava Barmari. The first one being related to the previous topic of the discussion. And this is a very fascinating series that we're going to embark on now where basically what they're talking about is that there are certain, you know, things of folk wisdom that, you know, everybody knows. Uh, and is there a source in the Bible for this folk wisdom? The idea being that all the wisdom in the world is contained in the Bible if you know how to, you know, suss it out. So here we go. Uh, so Rava said to Rava Barmari, 
From where is this matter derived? Whereby the sages stated, anyone who asks for compassion from heaven on behalf of another, and he requires compassion from heaven concerning the same matter, he is answered first. Right? So if you, you know, you're having a big problem, like let, let's say you're young, you're single, you, you're, you're looking for your soulmate you can't find, uh, and you have a friend in the same situation, that if you pray for your friend to find their soulmate, then heaven is going to smile kindly on you. And in fact, then you'll end up, you know, your soulmate will, be, will come around, right? Because you prayed for another who has the same need that you do. And from where do we know this? In scripture. Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source for this is as it is written, and the Lord changed the fortune of Job when he prayed for his friends. And Rabbi said to him, well, you said a proof from there, from a verse in the writings, and I say a proof from here, from a verse in the Torah. Right, so the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, known as the Tanakh, uh, Tanakh is an abbreviation for Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, uh, meaning the, the, the Torah, the first five books, uh, then the prophets, and then the writings. Like the writings include Psalms, Proverbs, etc. The prophets, you know, it's obvious. Uh, so those are the three sections of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and the Torah has a little bit of, you know, privileged position. The first five books are considered more prominent than the rest of the Bible. Uh, and so why? So you said a proof from there, from a verse in the writings, and I say the proof from here, from a verse in the Torah, as it is written, and Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Avimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bore children. And it is written immediately following that, and the Lord remembered Sarah, as he had said, with the pronoun interpreted homiletically, as Abraham said with regard to Abimelech. Because Abraham prayed for Abimelech that the women of his household should be, you know, able to give birth, Abraham himself was answered concerning the same matter with his wife Sarah. Rabbah said to Rabbah Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say, the cabbage is damaged together with the thorn... Uh, since the cabbage is sometimes harmed when the thorn is removed. Are there thorns in cabbage plants? No, of course not. What they're saying is, if your cabbage plants abut thorns, right, thistle, uh, thorny plants that are often, you know, dry and in the way, but grow all over the place, and you want to remove those thorny weeds, you got to be very careful because you might also harm the delicate cabbage plants, right? So it's kind of an aphorism, a general the idea that be careful, right, when you're, uh, don't throw out the baby with the bath water, right, that kind of idea. So from where uh, is there, do we have a source for this in scripture? So Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written, why will you contend with me? You all, why will you contend with me? You all have transgressed against me, says the Lord, Jeremiah 2.29. The term you all includes even those who have not sinned, right? So in other words, when there's a population uh, and the, the sins of the population become egregious enough, so the whole population will suffer, including the innocent. Uh, so Rava said to him, you said the proof from there from a verse in the prophets. And I say the proof from here from a verse in the Torah. The Lord said to Moses, after some of the people collected the manna on Shabbos, right? God said, you're going to get a double portion on Friday, so don't go out on Saturday uh, to collect manna. Or, you know, on the other days of the week, only collect what you need for that day because there's going to be more tomorrow. Uh, and the people didn't listen. So God said to Moses, how long do you, you plural, uh, refuse to keep my commandments and my laws. And the term you refuse, me'antem, written in the plural second person, indicating that even Moses was included, although he certainly did not sin. Right? When you're among a people who sins, you get caught up uh, in their consequences. Rava said to Rabba Barmari, it is written with regard to Joseph, and from among his brothers he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Who are these five men? And Rabbi Barmari said to him, this is what Rabbi Yochanan says, 
uh, those whose names were repeated in the blessings with which Moses later blessed the 12 tribes. And they are Don, Zebulun, God, uh, I'm sorry, Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. See Deuteronomy 35. Since they were weak, Joseph brought them before Pharaoh so that Pharaoh wouldn't think, oh, wow, all these Jews are coming. If they're men of you know, great strength, I'll use them in my army. And Joseph wanted the, you know, his family, his tribe, to just be left alone in the land of Goshen. Joseph could see that that was something they needed while they were in Egypt. Eventually, you know, the Jews assimilated into the culture and it got very bad for them. When a new Pharaoh arose, they became enslaved, etc. Now, Rabbah said Judah also had his name repeated in the blessings and he was strong. And Rabbah Barmari said to him, his name was repeated for his own matter. As Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says, that Rabbi Yonason said, what is the meaning of that which is written concerning Reuben and Judah in Moses' blessing of the tribes at the end of his life, where he said, let Reuben live and not die in that his men become few. And immediately afterward, in the following verse, it states, and this for Judah, and he said, hear, Lord, the voice of Judah and bring him unto his people. May his hands fight on his behalf and you shall be a help against his adversaries. What is the connection between the blessing of Reuben and that of Judah, which are juxtaposed with the conjunction and? And Rabbi Yochanan said, all those 40 years that the Jewish people were in the desert, the bones of Judah, which the Jewish people took with them from Egypt, along with the bones of his brothers, were rolling around in the coffin until Moses came and asked for mercy on Judah's behalf. And Moses said before God, master of the universe, who served as the impetus, who served as the impetus for Reuben, that he should confess his sin through which he merited a blessing and was not excluded from the count of the 12 sons of Jacob. It was Judah. As Reuben saw him confess his sin in the incident of Tamar, and thereby he did the same and achieved an atonement in that way. So immediately after Moses prayed, the verse states, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. So his bones entered their sockets and his skeleton became attached. The angel still did not elevate him into the heavenly study hall. Moses then prayed and bring him unto his people. I bring him to those in the heavenly study hall. And this prayer was accepted But he still did not know what the sages were saying, and he was unable to deliberate in Torah matters with the sages. And Moses then prayed, may his hands fight on his behalf, meaning that he should have the ability to contend with them in the study hall. Right? You get the picture. Judah's bones are being carried around by the children of Israel in the wilderness after they leave Egypt. Uh, because all the brothers actually were buried in Egypt. And and like Joseph, their bones were brought out of Egypt so they could be buried in the Holy Land. And Judah's bones were not at rest, right? Indicating that he was having trouble in the next world until Moses prayed for him. And Moses had to pray for him kind of thoroughly so that Judah would not just be at peace, but would be at the highest levels of heaven and be able to contend in the heavenly study hall uh, with the other sages up there who were deliberating Torah. Uh, still he, but still he was unable to draw conclusions from his discussion in accordance with the halacha. Moses then prayed, and you shall be a help against his adversaries. Right, And so why were we talking about Judah and Reuben when we were saying you know, that the cabbage is damaged along with the thorn. Uh, it's funny, I don't, you know. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really getting it, you know. I mean, it's sort of like Judah... I guess the idea was that that, that Judah, uh, you know, and Reuben, uh, or, you know, Judah had made an atonement and he should have been done. uh, But he was, you know, mixed up with other people, I guess, you know, who had sinned. And that that made it difficult for him to move on into the next world. I'm sort of unsatisfied with that explanation. So I'm really not sure why that story is mentioned here. But the Gemara moves on. So Rava said to Rabba, if you have an idea, let me know. So Rava said to Rabba Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say poverty follows the poor? Uh, and Rabba Barmari said to him, as we, this is as we learned in the Mishnah. Right, so now he's saying we learn it in the Mishnah. Uh, and then Rava is going to say that he ha- he's going to find it in the Torah. Right. So uh, Rabba Barmari says, well, this is as we learn in the Mishnah. 
rich people would bring first fruits in baskets of gold and silver, and poor people would bring the first fruits, Bikurim, in wicker baskets made of peeled willow. And they would give the baskets and the first fruits to the priests. And the rich would have their baskets returned to them, while the poor would not. Now, this seems to be to the disadvantage of the poor. What do you mean? Everybody has to bring first fruits. The rich bring it in silver and gold baskets, and their baskets are returned to them. The poor bring in wicker baskets, and the baskets are kept. So it seems like the poor, who, you know, don't, they can't afford the expensive baskets, they brought what they could, and they don't even get their baskets back. But remember what the whole idea of the temple was, that this is a way to connect with the Holy One above in a very direct and experiential way that, you know, is not possible since the temple was destroyed. It's why we pray for the restoration of the temple every day. Uh, so the fact that their baskets were accepted along with their fruits is a tremendous merit to the poor people uh, that the rich people don't receive, right? So it's actually an advantage to the poor people. But on the surface, they lost their baskets and the rich people didn't. So this would seem to be a proof of this folk wisdom, uh, poverty follows the poor. So Rava said to him, you said that proof from there, from a Mishnah. I say it from here, a verse in the Torah, now we're on 92b. The verse states with regard to one diagnosed with saras, right? Uh, the skin condition, which is a physical manifestation of a spiritual malady. With regard to this, it says, and the Mitzora, the one suffering from this, the Mitzora in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall go loose, and he shall cover his upper lip, and he shall cry, unclean, unclean. Right? Tame, tame. So not only must the Mitzora suffer from the Tsaras itself, he must also undergo further embarrassment by publicizing his condition. And this is akin to the aphorism that poverty follows the poor. Rava said to Rabba Barmari, from where is the matter derived whereby the sages stated, awaken early and eat in the summer due to the heat and in the winter due to the cold. And similarly, people say 60 runners run and do not reach the man who ate in the morning. <laughs> this would seem to be a big proof of the idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to contradict the sages who are saying you got to eat early in the morning. I will say that the saying that was on TV, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, entered American consciousness because of the lobby in Washington of breakfast cereals. Uh, you know, and the, the food that you should eat early in the morning uh, is probably not a bowl of sugar. <laughs> okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Now, Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written, they shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall they heat nor the sun smite them, indicating that one who is not hungry or thirsty will not be affected by the weather. Rabbi said to him, you said the proof from there, from a verse in the prophets, and I say the proof from here, from a verse in the Torah. The verse states, and you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. Exodus 23, 25. And Rav explains, and you shall serve the Lord your God. This is referring to the recitation of the morning Shema and the prayer, the Amidah. And he will bless your bread and your water. This is referring to bread dipped in salt and a flask of water drunk after the bread in the mornings, right? Uh, and from this point forward, the remainder of the verse applies, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. And there is a note here that after, after morning prayers, not before, after morning prayers, one should eat bread, right? It is a mitzvah to eat bread in the morning. Now remember, whenever you eat bread, you're having a meal as opposed to a snack, uh, which requires washing and a blessing on the bread. And then the grace after the meal, right? The long prayer that you say after the meal. Uh, and if you do that early in the morning, you can see why, you know, that is a very positive act. Uh, I need to do a little bit more research. Like, is one obligated to eat bread in the morning? Or is it more, you know, the kind of mitzvah that you don't have to do, but it's good if you do it, right? Uh, uh, 
but at any rate, it's very good to do that, right? So to have a small meal, you know, whatever. It doesn't say the size of it. But after morning prayers, you should eat bread, right? So that means you would bench and, and bless. I mean, you would bless and bench. Okay. Uh, and it is taught in a Barisa sickness. This is referring to bile. And why is its name called sickness, Mahala? It is called that it is called this since there are 83 sicknesses in bile. And the letters spelling the word Mahala, meaning mem, ches, lamid, he, have that numerical value of 83. And with regard to all of those sicknesses, eating bread dipped in salt in the morning and drinking a flask of water afterward negates them. Rava said to Rav of Armari, from where is this matter derived whereby the sages stated, if your friend calls you a donkey, prepare a saddle for your back, i.e., do not contest his statement. Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written in the conversation between the angel and Hagar. And he said, Hagar, maid servant of Sarai, from where did you come and to where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the face of my mistress Sarai. Uh, and though Hagar was no longer the maidservant of Sarai, right? Sarai, that was her name before it was changed to Sarah. Since the angel referred to her as such, she responded in kind, right? The angel deemed her friend in this situation because, in fact, right, it was her friend. Uh, he was doing good for her. And it's a very interesting teaching, right? Uh... The many commentaries explain that this, uh, prepare a saddle for your back, that this expression, right, if your friend calls you a donkey, prepare a saddle for your back. Many commentaries explain that this expression teaches a lesson in humility and in interpersonal relationships. That it is not helpful for a person to argue with one who relates to him disparagingly. One should quietly accept the, accept the evaluation of the other. And similarly, the Mayri writes that it is commendable for one to be cognizant of one's own faults and accept what others say, even if it is not complimentary. The early commentaries have two explanations with regard to the scope of this aphorism, perhaps based on two variant readings of the text. Some explain that this refers only to a situation where the other is in fact correct in his evaluation, while others assert that even if the interlocutor is mistaken, one should still react in this manner. And there's another verse, and there's another version of the text that reads, put a saddle on his back, which is explained to mean act with another in the same manner that he acts with you. Bottom line, uh, there is a sort of general teaching that's quite beautiful, uh, which says that God is, I've said this to you, right? God is always speaking to us. He's always speaking to us in the language of events, right? So you, you want to be, Always looking around and asking, you know, what, what is God saying? What does God want from me? What, what, what is God saying by this event that happened to me? You know, and this is the kind of thinking that, that can really help you when you're in really tough times. And it can say, okay, well, you know, this was arranged by God for me. It seems terrible right now. Uh, but I've seen at other times in my life that would seem to be like a door slamming in my face. Later, I could see, thank God that happened because a different door opened that I wouldn't have taken but for the initial misfortune. So, you know, you don't tell that to other people, but you tell it to yourself, uh, and it can be very helpful. Now, an even higher level of that uh, is that whatever people say to you is also a message that's being communicated to you. Now, this is not easy, right? Because there are awful people in the world who say really nasty stuff because they're jerks. Right? And you don't want to, you know, take to heart what jerks are saying, uh, especially if you're a person who's already suffering from self-esteem issues. So we're not saying that, you know, whatever nasty stuff people say to you about yourself, you should believe them. What we're saying is take it in and ask yourself, you know, is there any truth to that? Is there something that I can learn from it? Uh, by which I can better myself, or is this just person a jerk, right? Now, it may be that the person is simply a jerk, but what's useful is to take that pause and wonder. And certainly not. don't bother getting into arguments with people who are nasty and critical of you. That's not going to go anywhere. 
Just listen, think about it. Maybe the right answer is dismiss it. Maybe the right answer is to learn from it. But you won't even know if that, that possibility, if you get in an argument with them or just refuse to hear it, just let it go. You know, let it go. Uh, if people are damaging your reputation, if people are harming you, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your other, other acquaintances or your community, that's a different story. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So if your friend calls you a donkey, prepare a saddle for your back. So Rob, so where do we know this from? And Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is as it is. Oh, sorry, so I already read that. So Rabbi said to Rabbi, Rabbi Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say, another aphorism, common wisdom, if you are aware of a derogatory matter that is found in you. And by the way, the previous one, it said, it wasn't if someone calls you a donkey. It said if your friend calls you a donkey, right? So someone who cares about you tells you that you're behaving badly. That's definitely something, you know, you want to listen to and think about. Now, the next one. Uh, if you are aware of a derogatory matter that is found in you, say it first before others say it about you. Uh, and Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written with regard to Eliezer, Abraham's servant. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. Genesis 24, 34, immediately proclaiming that he is a servant. Right, so it's not something they're going to find out about him and you know weaponize against him. He said it first. So you know, we talked about this before, but it's like that Eminem song in Eight Mile, right, where they're having kind of like a rap battle, and part of that battle is insulting the other guy, you know. And Eminem was like, "What are you going to say about me?" You know, and then he says every negative thing about himself in really you know amazing musical rhyme. Uh, and it just leaves the enemy speechless, the opponent, right? The, the guy had nothing to say, and Eminem had said it all, and said it more poetically and more rhythmically than the guy ever could. Uh, so it just defangs your enemy when you, you know, cough, you know, own up your own faults first. Rava said to Rabba Barmari, from where is this matter derived, whereby people say, the goose stoops its head as it goes, as it goes along, but its eyes look afar to find food for itself. And Rab of Armari said to him that the source is as it is written with regard to Avigail's statement to David, who would future be King David. And when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Right, so this is where Avigail, uh, her husband, was, was a bit of a donkey who was getting in David's way, you know, when David was on the run from King Saul, I believe. Uh, and, you know, she said, don't kill him. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's an idiot, please. Uh, but, you know, she, she argued for and saved her husband's life, but she could see that her husband was a donkey. Uh, and she ended up being one of David's wives, right? So she, you know... She, she was working both short-term and long-term, right? So she had vision. Uh, and so what does it say? Uh, and when the Lord... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So although Avigail spoke with humility in her request that David spare her husband's life, she made reference to deriving future benefit from David. Rava said to Rava Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say, 60 discomforts come to the teeth of one who hears the sound of another eating and does not eat. And Rabbi Varmari said to him that the source is as it is written with regard to what Nathan the prophet said concerning the coronation banquet of Adonijah, to which he was not invited. For he has gone down this day and has slain oxen and fatlings and sheep in abundance and has called all the king's sons. But me, even me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Beniah the son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon he has not called. So this is when they were telling old King David uh, that his son Adonijah uh, was crowning himself the successor to David uh, in place of David's chosen Solomon. Uh, and, you know, they did, he did not get away with it. <laughs> Solomon did become the next king. Uh, at any rate, there's this idea, right, that when you see, and, and there's actually a note here that scientifically this is also true, that if you're very hungry, you know, you haven't eaten in a while, and then you see other people eating, 
uh, that this actually creates a chemical reaction inside of you, like makes your hunger much worse. And if you don't feed it, then you can, you know, have stomach pains and get ill from that. So you should eat. So Rava said to him, you said the proof from there, from a verse in the prophets. And I say the proof from here, from a verse in the Torah. As it is written, and Isaac brought her into his mother, Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted for his mother. And it is written immediately afterward, and Abraham took another wife after Sarah had died, right? And her name was Keturah. After seeing his son marry, Abraham was disquieted by the fact that he was not married. And this is akin to one who sees another eating and does not eat. So Abraham took the matter in hand and remarried. Uh, Rava said to Rabba Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say, while the wine belongs to its owner, the gratitude is given to the one who pours it. And Rabba Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written with regard to God commanding Moses to transfer his authority to Joshua. And the Lord said unto Moses, take you, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is spirit, and lay your hand upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may hearken. Numbers 27, verses 18 through 20. And it is written, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Deuteronomy 34, 9. Now, where does the spirit that filled Joshua come from? It comes from God. Who did the people give credit to? Moses. Although the Spirit of God was not given to Joshua by Moses, as Moses was only a conduit, he was given credit for it. Rava said to Rabba Bar, and this is because right, you know, people are simple, they lack vision, and they, 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 you know, when they see cause and effect in front of them, they just say, that's it, and they don't think more deeply about it. Know your audience. Rava said to Rabba Bar Mari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say a dog in its hunger swallows even dung? And Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written, the full soul loads a honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Proverbs 27, 7. Rabbi said to Rabbi Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say a bad palm tree strolls? and goes to be among a grove of barren trees, meaning bad people seek out other bad people to hang out with. And Rabbi Barmari said to him, this matter is written in the Torah, repeated in the prophets, and triplicated in the writings. And we learned it in a Mishnah as well, and we learned it in a Baraisa as well. Right? This idea that bad people associate together, uh, and this general teaching of who are you? Who your friends are, right? Who you associate with is going to have such a profound effect on your, on your characteristics, your traits, your mitos, uh, the way you behave, that it is crucial to surround yourself with righteous people, admirable people, honorable people. If you surround yourself with dishonorable people, wicked people, are you going to be so surprised when you end up being one of them? And we see that that, that expressed throughout scripture, and the oral Torah. So Rabbi Barmari explains each of the sources. It is written in the Torah, as it is written. And so Esau went to Ishmael. It is repeated in the prophets, as it is written. And they were gathered vain fellows to Yifta, and they went out with him. And it is triplicated in the writings, as it is written. All fowl, fowl like, you know, poultry, all fowl will live with its kind and men with those like him. We learned in a Mishnah, all that is attached to that which is ritually impure is ritually impure. And all that, it, all that is attached to that which is ritually pure is ritually pure. And we learned in a Baraisa, Rabbi Eliezer says, Not for naught did the starling go to the raven, but because it is its kind, as it too is a non-kosher bird. Rava said to Rabbi Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say, if you called to your friend and he did not answer you, throw a large wall and cast it at him, i.e., do not attempt to help him anymore. Right? If, you had, if you were in a time of great need and you asked your friend to help you and he turned his back on you, yeah, so that's not really your friend. That's the bottom line here. 
So how do we know this? Rabbi Barmari said to him, the source is as it is written, because I have purged you and you are not purged and you shall not be purged from your impurity anymore until I have satisfied my fury upon you. Uh, presumably that's God speaking in Ezekiel 24, 13. Rabbah said to Rabbah Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say, if there is a well that you drank from, do not throw a stone into it. And Rabbah Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian because you were a stranger in his land. Since you dwelled in their lands, you may not cause them harm. Rava said to Rabba Barmari, from where is this matter derived? Whereby people say, if you lift the load with me, I will lift it. And if you will not lift it with me, I won't lift it. And Rabba Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written with regard to Barak ben Avinoam and Devorah concerning the war of Sisera, right? Devorah the judge. Uh, and Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she answered him, fine, then I will go with you. But uh, the, the enemy will not be delivered into your hand. It will be delivered into the hand of a woman. He figured it meant Devorah, but actually ended up being Yael. That's Judges 4.8. Rava said to Rabba Barmari, from where is this matter derived whereby people say, when we were small, we were considered to be men. Now that we are old, we are considered to be children. And Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is that initially it is written with regard to the Jewish people traveling in the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them in the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Right? The Lord himself was with them. Uh, but at the end, after some time passed, and it would be expected that the Jewish people were considered more important, then it is written, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you by the way, indicating that an angel was sent in place of God to guard the Jewish people. I'm almost done. Questions or comments, please get them in. <clears throat> uh, and Rava said to Rabba Barmari, From where is this matter derived, whereby people say, Drag wood after a property owner. In other words, help out a wealthy man, even in a small way, as this may lead to him helping you out. Rabbi Barmari said to him that the source is as it is written, and Lot, right, Abraham's nephew, and Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, right? Again, who are you who you associate with? So if it's possible to associate with successful people, that also can rub off on you. So long as they're righteous people. Okay, seems like I only have one question from Sharon. This teaching reminds me of the blessing in the Birkat HaShachar, Asher Yatsar, right? So in the morning blessing, she's talking about the bathroom blessing. That reminds us of how we are divinely created with all of our bodily openings and closings working well and that this is a blessing. I think this teaching further emphasizes this lesson. Very much so, right? When we're talking about Avi Malik's household, that their, you know, their orifices were stopped up. Uh, you know, you don't know, you don't really, you take for granted that you eat, you go to the bathroom, whatever, until something doesn't work. I have a friend, tragically, he's extremely ill. He's no longer able to eat. He's wasting away. Please, God, please, God, grant their healing, a refuah shlema to David ben Mindel Shena. Uh, you know, so he doesn't take that for granted anymore. Uh, and likewise, if you can't go to the bathroom, you know, if you're stopped up, uh, you will very quickly not take that for granted, right? So it's very good to be grateful when things are working properly, and that's the blessing of Shoyatsar uh, that, uh, that Sharon is referring to. That's what I've got for us tonight, and with God's help, we'll be together again tomorrow, Sunday, at the regular time, 6 p.m. Pacific. Have a great night.